But um, even though we're meeting together because God has called us together and we're family and we uh, want to be obedient to Him, we also have some appointed leaders and they've, they've set some, some stipulations for our gathering. And we want to, as best we can, honor God and obey Him and uh, obey the law. Now, there, there may come a time where there's a line drawn in the sand and we'll have to choose if we're going to follow God or follow man. Um, that happened in the chapter, chapters ahead here in Acts where we've been these past few weeks. Um, this isn't that day. Okay? We're, not, uh, we're not going to have to decide who we're going to follow. We're at a point now where we do both. So if, uh, you know, we have some empty seats and some overflow, that's, uh, that's an inconvenience. Um, you know, I, I mentioned a lot that there are folks who are meeting around the world um, just like we are, and their lives are in danger, and it has nothing to do with any virus. There are folks who died this week because they met in Jesus' name. Um, martyrs. Uh, it will happen after we've forgotten about the coronavirus. And you're like, well, what do you mean forgotten about it? How often do you think of SARS? How often do you think of swine flu? How often do you think of legionnaires? Remember that one? Um, when this is a distant memory, there will still be brothers and sisters who are in peril just for obeying God. And, and, and he's okay with that. Um, not because he's mean, but because he hasn't guaranteed us a comfortable Wednesday. He's guaranteed us eternity with him, and he's going to keep that promise. Um, you know, do we want to die? No, well, no, you know, we don't want to be foolish. So we've got some hand cleaners, and we've got some distance, and we're going to be cautious. Um, I, I do want to encourage you um, to have faith over fear, okay? But not a uh, faith type of foolishness, faith type of facts. So if someone tells you it's a good practice to wash your hands and you think it's silly humming happy birthday so that you have a, a long enough time, um, just be silly and wash your hands and be safe. And, and have faith that even if you wash your hands right and you get coronavirus anyway, that God has you and he's taking care of you and you're going to be fine no matter what happens. Because the worst this world and the worst this virus can do to you is kill you. An eternity with Jesus where there's no tears, there's no suffering, and there's no hardship is not a loss at the end of the day. So I want to keep us focused. Again, we're going to have faith, we're going to have facts, and we're going to let that uh, help us overcome our fears. Um, what else? Um, we are actually having an adult meeting on Wednesday. No kids. Um, we met for prayer this last week, and uh, we'll meet for prayer this coming week. We're going to follow the same rules. You know, we're going to try to get our social distance. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, if you're not a family member, six foot is recommended. Um, but we're going to meet and we're going to pray. Uh, now's not the time to stop praying. Now's not the time for us to separate. Um, now is the time for us to connect. Now, if the rules change, um, or if, you know, the virus spreads and makes that unwise, we'll find another way. Um, most of you heard about today through text message, right? Um, we've got that. Um, you know, the reason I have this mic in the first place is because we were recording sermons at one time. Um, we can still do that. Um, you know, Facebook, FaceTime, uh, there's lots of ways where we can still continue. But before we get to that, um, we have this right now. Um, so I want to encourage you. And if you haven't heard any rules changed and you know that we're gathering, show up. Um, you know, it will be okay. If you're down the hallway, you won't be sitting down there all alone. If you're just outside the door, I still see you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all good. Um, why? Um, let me throw another uh, why on there while we're hitting the whys. Um, this is a great exchange of information. Now, there is um, the usual stuff. We're hearing from God, okay? And that is great. 
Um, and you can do that at home too. And I hope that you are. I mean, I hope the only time you hear out of this book is not on Sunday. That would be sad. And, and, and bad practice. Um, otherwise, the exchange. We're praising God. Hey, we still love you. We still believe you. You know what? God knows our hearts, but it's good for me to say that out loud. It's good for me to praise him and to acknowledge him. You know why? Because it centers me on him and it helps me focus. Um, there was a, a movie a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago. Several years ago. And there was a circumstance where there was this little bear cub and there was this critter that was going to eat the bear cub. And then all of a sudden the critter gets scared and takes off. And you see this little bear go up standing up and going, rawr, rawr, And you're like, why did that mountain lion take off? Because it could totally eat that baby bear. And then you look behind it and there's this big mom bear standing up. And, uh, you know, that's who God is. It's not me against coronavirus. It's not me against the world. It's not me against anything. It's God moving. It's God working and me focusing on him. So his word is great. But praising him is just important because it gives me that perspective. We're singing to him, you're awesome, you're mighty, you're wonderful. Um, and it reminds me. And those words that are coming out of my mouth, they have to circulate around my brain. And if they circulate, circulate in my brain long enough, they start to seep in my heart. It reminds me of not just what I believe, but who I believe in. Um, it's also a great information exchange for um, prayer, petitions, concerns. Um, twofold on that one, because God says in His Word, He already knows before we ask. It's so good to ask, again, for the same reasons it's so good to sing Him songs and pray, but it's also good for us. Pray for one another. Um, bear one another's burdens. That's what this book says you and I as family members should be doing for each other. Um, it's hard. We're not talking for me to know what your needs are. This is a great place for us to come together and we share those things and we can pray for one another in real time, but also know that there are needs. Um, you know, we heard about Rocky. Uh, we don't see Rocky a whole lot. We see Cassie. But it's nice to know what's going on in her life. And we already know she's got some respiratory stuff going on and some other health issues. But her load just got a little heavier. Not to mention that she's got uh, a young one that's out of school and home too. So she's juggling a lot. And just by coming here and just by exchanging that information, we can see that, hey, that's one person that we need to rally around. Um, Bob's doing great. And Bob will tell you, you know, for an 80-year-old man, I'm doing pretty good. And But Bob's life got a little bit more complicated. It's nice for us to know that because there's things that we can do to help him and accommodate him. So it's important that we're meeting for communication, vertical, and horizontal. That's just two examples. Um, probably in the intro, and I want to get to this. And I'll be honest with you, I really went back and forth of, do we need to do something positive and encouraging? Do I need to pull some extra message out? And God, in my mind and in my heart, is saying, stay the course. So, spoiler, we're just moving to Acts 14. Um, it's not a coronavirus sermon. Uh, but here is what it is. It's going through the story of real people who have real lives, they're living in real time, and they're having real difficulties, but they also have a real God who's yeah. coming through. And so it's encouraging enough um, just to see that God is there and he's in control. But let me, uh, let me get to the story. While you're turning to Acts chapter 14, I'm going to do one more little bit of business. <clears throat> Local churches aren't meeting freely because of logistics. Um, there are um, lots of folks who already have thriving media ministries, not necessarily good stuff. So 
So I'll put out this thing of, yep, you know, look at some sermons online and maybe see some TV programs, but be careful who you listen to. Um, because the wolves are out. And there's a lot of prosperity guys that are going to tell you uh, some silly stuff. Um, there are a lot of end times guys that are going to tell you some silly stuff. And so I want to encourage you to stick with good, solid um, teachers. You're going to know them because they're going to open up the Bible and they're going to present it in context and they're not going to embellish it. They're going to let God's word stand because it's God's word. Uh, I'm just going to give you one example because you know I'm a context guy. Not long ago, like last week, um, Paul is teaching and he pulls a verse from Habakkuk and he applies it correctly in the context. And, and it's this verse right here. He, uh, he says, and this is from, from chapter 13, he says, Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Now, historically in Habakkuk, God tells Habakkuk, you people are sinning and far from me, but don't worry, because I have some bad guys north of here, and they're going to come down, and they're going to beat you to a pulp, and when you're bloodied and bruised, you'll also be repentant, and then I'll come in, and I'll bring you back close to me once I have your attention. Okay? That happened. Um, and I mean, that really did happen because Habakkuk's like, no, surely God, you wouldn't do something like that. He's like, stand on the wall and watch me because it's coming. Mm-hmm. All right? That's not what's happening now. Okay? Not what's happening now. Um, what he's telling them in, in chapter 13 is that work you wouldn't believe is even though it doesn't look like God would be interested in that. And even though you may not believe God is interested in you, God is saving people. Mm-hmm. And he's doing that through the most unlikely of circumstances. He sent his son to live a perfect life and then be slaughtered for sinners so that you could have an exchange of his righteousness for your sin and shame. I know it seems too good to be true, but here is the work that God has done. His name is Jesus. Don't you want that? And they were astounded. And they believed. And they were saved. There's been some guys who have already been pulling this verse out. I'm going to tell you again, it's not about the coronavirus. When Paul pulled that verse out and applied it to Jesus. That's what God has said from that moment on. There are some things that are going on that are difficult. But what's outstanding, outstanding, astounding, incredible, is that even in the darkness that's fallen across the world, even in the shadow of the coronavirus, God is still in control and is still still saving people. So don't let someone get your emotions up. Don't let someone sell you a bill of goods. Stick with guys who stick to the text the way God wrote it and the way God intended it. All right. Sermon at O. We're going into Acts chapter 14. The first three words say, Now in Iconium. For historical context, they have moved into uh, Galatia. That's the area. Um, It's defined by uh, uh, folks who were uh, the Gauls. That was a people group. Um, Most folks who look at them historically actually liken them to Americans. It says that they're bold and proud and that they're also fickle and easily swayed. And very full of themselves. And uh, if you were going to look at Americans, we're like that. We're, we're, we're bold, we're brazen, um, we're very full of ourselves, but we're also fickle. And if you don't believe that's true, look at the heroes that we've turned on through the years. I mean, especially during this PC climate, how many people, well, let's just mention one. Um, how many people grew up watching the Cosby show and eating Jell-O pudding pops like me? 
No, Cosby's in prison, okay? He deserved to be in prison. He did some bad stuff. But he was a hero at one time, and as soon as there was blood in the water, people turned on him quick. So it wasn't just one gal testifying alone. Now she's got dozens, and we're like that. So if you're today's hero, political princess, uh, movie star of the week, and you are just one bit of bad press away from everyone in the country turning on you. Um, we're like that. The sad part is, is we're like that with God, too. And we know that that's true because look at the rise of cult cults. Um, you know, the folks that were wearing the same tennis shoes that all poisoned themselves. Um, I forget what that doomsday cult was. We had the group in Waco uh, that followed David Koresh. Um, he's got cult bottle lenses, but he's telling people he's the son of God, and they're buying it. Um, you know, the one I hate the most because it happened on my birthday, Jonestown. Um, again, another guy who just did some incredible, incredible shady stuff, and people bought that. And what I'm saying is, is the people who first went were looking for God, but turned off to whatever because we're fickle. So when you think of these folks, think of, hey, we're probably a lot like them. As a matter of fact, Paul is going to write the churches in Galatia a letter, and we call it Galatians. And there's two things that just off the top of my head stand out about that letter that he tells them. The first one is, is, hey, listen, there's only one message. Do not believe another gospel, not that there actually is one. And he says this, eat. If an angel tells you something different than what we told you when we were with you, do not believe them. Does anybody know the roots of the golden tablets in Mormonism? An, an angel came, mm -hmm. presented some new gospel. So God's verse says, even if an angel comes and don't believe them, we've got a whole religious sect based on the opposite of God's word. The other thing that stands out, chapter 3, he's like, foolish Galatians, that's what he calls them. And he's like, what are you doing? Did we not teach you that you're saved by grace? Why are you believing the lie that you have to earn your salvation? Mm -hmm. If you could earn your salvation, the law was good enough, but you couldn't. And so that's what Jesus has done. And you have received this through the free gift of grace. Don't spoil it by trying to earn what God has handed you. Because you never will. Ultimately, what God says is if you want to live by the law, you will die by the law. But if you will humble yourself and fall on his mercies, you can be saved by grace. That's the Galatians. So if you're ever going through stories about them, it sounds familiar. He said they were a lot like us. Or we're a lot like them. So now in Iconium, they entered together uh, into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks <coughs> believed. So who's they? Well, you've got Paul and Barnabas, right? This is Paul's first missionary journey is what we call it, which is kind of sad because Barnabas was with him and Paul gets all the credit in their minds. But anyway, they moved in and as is their custom, as is their practice, they go into the synagogue. Now, not every town has a synagogue. The rule was is that if you had at least 10 Jewish men in town, they were supposed to have a synagogue. So um, Iconium does, but other towns like Lystra, for instance, which we'll get to later on, doesn't. And, but if there was a synagogue, then whoever was teaching, in this case Paul and Barnabas, would go into the synagogue and they would present the, the truth to the Jews first. Who started that practice? Jesus. Jesus. Um, there's great allowances made that once the, the Jews have heard and ultimately rejected the gospel, that it would pass on to the Gentiles. Amen. For me and you, Gentiles. Um, but first opportunity goes to the Jewish folks. And in this case, a great number of them believed. Awesome. Awesome. Isn't it nice when God tells you, I want you to go here and I want you to do this thing, that you're successful? I mean, don't be like that. 
and nobody ever wants god to send you on you know some kind of errand and you're just a complete flop we all have that expectation god would never send me somewhere and have me fail which is funny when you look at guys like moses you know who is the most humble man ever and talks to god face to face and then walks millions of people in a circle for 40 years till they all die and then he's done but hey it's another sermon another day Verse 2 says this, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So, they go to church in town. They present the gospel, a good contingency of Jewish folks and a good contingency of non-Jewish folks believe. Yay! However, Jewish folks who didn't believe start catching up with the Gentile folks who didn't believe. That's the group we're talking about in stirring up dissension. Um, isn't it sad that a lot of times the greatest resistance that we have in the church is our, I'm going to do some air quotes here for the people in the back room, brothers and sisters. People who say they love the same God that we love, that are reading the same book that we're reading, and you know, supposedly should be on the same page that we're all on, and instead, it turns out that that's where we get the most resistance, that's mm -hmm. where we get the most trouble. Um, I, I, I love to say, those people, oh gosh, I just can't stand those people. And uh, there have been times in my life where I actually have said that, said that out loud. But let me tell you what God says about that. He says, Jeff, stop worrying about those people and you be here. I have other people doing other jobs than what I have you doing. And if you're not careful, you will criticize them and my work and me because you don't understand what's going on. You say that you love me, and you say that you're following hard after me, but if you start looking at yourself instead of looking at me, you do become the one that criticize, and you become the stumbling block for people who are trying to seek me because you're just religious, and you love things the way that they've always been, and you reject it. And if you're not careful, you'll reject me. So what I'm telling you is, yeah, those people are out there, and you might be on the right and righteous path, and it might be your brothers and sisters that give you a bloody nose. But it's just as easy if you're not careful that you become one of those people, and you're critical of something you don't understand, and ultimately, you're critical of God. So what do you do in those situations? Well, you go to the source. God just doesn't seem right to me. So I'm going to need your help with this. You know, I've always followed you in this way, and I have always believed this, and it looks like this is something different, and let God speak for himself. Will there be occasions where it will be like, yes, that's garbage, that's not me, don't follow that? Then great. Then get up and follow him the way that you're supposed to. But you just may find, you just may find that he's like, that's me. Don't miss it. And for the Jewish folks in this town who rejected Paul's message, they rejected God himself. Mm. And missed out on the most amazing and wonderful gift ever, salvation. Don't be those guys. Yes, look out for those guys, but don't become one. What is God's response? And what is the response of his guys? We're getting criticism, Lord. They're making it uncomfortable for us. Well, they don't go anywhere. The next line says this. So they remain for a long time. Here's another little lesson for us. Sometimes it's um, easy to run when it gets uncomfortable. Sometimes it's easy to run when we're taking um, criticism. Um, I have heard this said through the years, and I have said it myself many times, 
that uh, if God doesn't release you, you can't go. You know, if God hasn't invited you, you can't stay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in line with Americans being like Galatians and being fickle, um, how many people do you know that uh, uh, aren't super happy in the church that they're in and it's the sixth church where that's been the case? Church hoppers. It's uncomfortable sometimes in church because it's full of regular people and regular people step on your toes or you step on regular people's toes and sometimes the brothers and sisters don't always get along. Um, but just kind of a rule of thumb in your church and in your town and in your job and in your life, if God hasn't invited you into a place, you can't stay there. You don't belong there. But the other side of that coin is, is if God hasn't released you, you can't go. What if it's hard? What if it's uncomfortable? What if it, you know, it's causing me to lose sleep and my hair's falling out? I don't even notice my hair's falling out. But it, if God doesn't release you, you can't go. Does God know that, that they're struggling? Absolutely. Does God know they're facing critics? Absolutely. Does God know it's really not their fault because they're just given his message? They're actually taking his criticism. Yeah, he knows. And he has them stay. And not just for a little while. He has them stay for a long time. And he didn't change the job. The next line says, speaking boldly for the Lord. Hey, it's uncomfortable. Every time I talk about Jesus, more people hate me. The job and the message is Jesus. And so that's what they have to do. And God's response to their obedience is this. It says that they were speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So they're seeing this great power from God. Now, it doesn't list any specific miracles in the section that we're going to cover today, but the very next section, the very next town, boom, it's a miracle. And everywhere that the gospel was going in these days, God was showing up, and he was putting an exclamation point behind his word by signs and wonders, miracles, being performed by the apostles. Lame were walking, blind were seeing, people were being healed of all kinds of infirmities. Demons were being cast out. You know, I wonder sometimes, and I'm sure that you do too, hey, well, how come that's not happening? Well, you don't leave room for that. Because I have to tell you, people I know who are ministering in every other country besides America are seeing these same, same things happen. Maybe God's not showing up miraculously because we haven't scheduled a slot in the service for him to come in and do his thing. Just the same. Maybe we're not making room for God. But God himself showed up. He bore witness by letting miracles be performed. So everyone in the city decided they were going to play nice, right? Because that's what always happens. You give them the gospel, God does a few miracles, and everybody loves you? (laughs) No. Verse 4 says this, But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, and some the apostles. Um, When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it, and the fled to Lystra and Derby, cities in Lyconia, and uh, to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Um, spoiler alert, just before we get to the end of this chapter, and not this week, but before we get to the end of this chapter, Paul's going to get stoned. Um, you know, not in, in a you know, legalized marijuana way. He's going to have people set rocks at him. Um, it's going to happen more than once. As a matter of fact, he's going to have it happen in a way where he's going to see a vision of heaven. A lot of people think that he he actually um, died for a little bit and God sent him back because he wasn't going to work it, but we'll hit that when we get to it in the text. Um, in this occasion, God let them be t- tipped off. They're going to stone you. In this occasion, God releases them to move on. 
So what he doesn't release them from is their obligation. See, these guys are ministers, messengers of God's word, and that's their job. And so God is going to change their town, but he's not going to change their mission. And they're going to move from town to town. In the next town, they're going to have some success and they're going to have some failures just like they had in this town. And God's expectation is, is that they stay the course and they enter in when he says enter and they leave when he says leave. And between those two things, he expects them to do what he told them to do. Um, okay. Anybody in the room possible? Or down the hall or just outside the room? I'm just going to go out in here and say none of us are apostles. Okay? None of us saw Jesus. None of us were, were uh, picked by him. Um, uh, anybody in the room uh, a missionary? We have some of those. We've got some folks down the hall. We've got some folks in this room who are missionaries. We have some folks, I'm just going to say, that are missionaries and you don't even realize it. You know why? Because everywhere you go and every group of people you encounter is an opportunity for you to spread the gospel. And so we like to think that, oh yeah, missionary means I went to Africa or South America or, you know, uh, China. And no, uh, if you went to the grocery store with the love of Jesus in your heart, you were a missionary to ATV. Now, you know, you may not get to spread the gospel every trip, but you should always be looking for God to tip you off of hey. See that gal over there looking for toilet paper and not finding any? Now is a great opportunity to tell her about hope and life in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because she's scared and she can't even find basic necessities for life. And she's wondering if I'm real and if I am real, what am I doing about all this? Not those 47 rolls you have at your house, maybe give her a couple of those. I'm just saying, <laughs> it's an opportunity. You're a missionary. Um, so, so, I just spoiled my own son. And I don't even care because I don't want to go along. I just want to take this opportunity to do exactly what we've done. All come together in Jesus' name. And all follow him obediently by opening ourselves up to him and giving him our praises through song and giving him our praises through tithes and offerings and offering to him our prayers and petitions and supplications and then opening our hearts and our minds to him by opening his word and hearing what he has said and reading what he has done and let him be the one that lifts our faith and let him be the one that grows our faith and let him be the one that gives us the boldness and the strength to follow him obediently. This is easy in here. But we're all going to leave in just a little bit and get in our cars and go back out there. And what do we do? Exactly what he's always wanted us to do. Um, I'm a little afraid. Is that okay? Absolutely. As long as you don't let your fear trump your faith and obedience to God. Um, you know, there's a, a storyline that will play out as we go through Acts where Paul will be heading back to Jerusalem so that he can ultimately be arrested and sent to the place where he's going to be executed and martyred for the gospel. And as he's doing his farewell tour, is, if you will, he goes to each town and they're like, hey, listen, God has shown us that when you go back to Jerusalem, you're going to die. Maybe you should 
cancel the trip because Paul's like, I know, isn't it awesome? I mean, look at me. I'm such a loser. Can you believe that God chose me of all people to die for the name of Jesus Christ? I mean, I can't even wrap my mind around how incredible that is that God would give me such an honor. And people would be like, I don't know about Brother Paul. He looks a little silly. And I'm asking you to go hug folks that have coronavirus. <laughs> um, I'm not asking you to do anything that you're uncomfortable with. What I am asking you to do is to listen to God. Amen. Amen. But I don't want that to be between anybody but you and him. I mean, let's be honest. God, when Frankie will pick on you here to be a medical professional. He wired you that way. Your brain works that way. You have uh, the intelligence, but you also have that compassion piece. You see people who need help, and you want to help them. And then we all see people who need help. Not all of us really have that desire to help them. I mean, we like them well enough and stuff, but not everybody just has a need to help them. And then, then many of us who have that, that desire to help them don't necessarily have the ability, but you have those two things. If you keep using the gifts and the talents that God gave you, and you move through the world doing the thing that God wired you to do, there's a great chance that of any of us in the room, you are the most likely to encounter someone with coronavirus. You just are. And you have a couple of choices. You hide at home, hope that the, you know, bottles of water and toilet paper holds up, or you can move forward and go to the places where God sends you and do the things that God made you to do, and trust that no matter what happens, you'll never slip through his fingers, that nothing will separate you from his love. Do we wash our hands? Yep, wash them raw. Um, happy birthday. Do we isolate um, reasonably? Absolutely. Um, do we consider folks who uh, are in categories um, older, younger, immunocompromised, and we try to be careful and, and courteous for, for those folks? Absolutely. Um, but we keep our eyes on God and put our faith in Him. And we go to the places he says go. We do the things that he says do. And in all of that, we trust him. You know, this book has never changed. From the very first time I read it to the most current. The awesome thing is, is that this book has never changed from the time that the first guy put pen to paper all the way up to 2020 when we're talking about it. And the reason this book has never changed is because the guy who really wrote it, his name is God, this never changed. Never. We can't trust the government. We can't even trust you. God has never failed. So I'm going to pray and uh, we're going to have an opportunity to uh, uh, sing to God one more time. This hasn't been a puff piece. It hasn't been all ruffles and flourishes. It hasn't been verses out of context. But I hope in this moment that you have seen God is God through all the circumstances and he is always in control and that no matter what whether it was in Paul's day or in all that our day he and he alone can be trusted um, let's pray Father I, I want to thank you for your word and I want it to, to just stand and so I'm not going to pray this you instill in our hearts of what you have for us on this day so each and every one of us leaves here with exactly what you intended for us to receive from you today. Uh, beyond that, Lord, uh, I just uh, want to rehash that you just uh, watch on. Uh,
Okay. We're just here sitting down.